section thirteen of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter eleven needham's narrative the drodger driven off from saba capsized the midshipmen save themselves on her side taken off by the sarah jane steer for cartagena the colonel on shore look out for his return you remember that night at saba mr higson when the three young gentlemen and i were left aboard the drodger and you and the other gentlemen went ashore to look after captain quasho as he called himself and his rascally black crew began needham who having recovered his voice was inclined to make good use of it by spinning a long yarn i should think i did indeed said higson but go ahead dick we want to hear how you and they were saved for i had little hope that you would be when i saw the drodger driven away from her anchorage by the hurricane nor had i sir i can tell you but i've always held that there's nothing like trying to do one's best in however bad a way one may seem to be continued needham i saw that there was only one thing we could do and that was to run before the wind and to try and keep the craft above water as to beating back i knew that the old roger would either have capsized or been driven on the rocks if we had made the attempt so i took the helm got a foot of the foresail hoisted the hatches battened down told the young gentlemen to lash themselves to the rigging if they didn't wish to be washed overboard and let the craft scud it was precious dark except every now and then when the flashes of lightning darted from the clouds and went zigzagging along on either side of us casting a red glare on the tops of the black seas from which the foam was blown off just for all the world as if a huge white sheet had been drawn over them the spoon drift too came straight along our deck over the taffrail as if it would cut our legs off for though we flew at a pretty good rate it flew faster and every now and then i turned my head i couldn't help thinking that one of thy big seas which came roaring on astern just for all the world like one of the savage monsters i've heard tell of eager to swallow us up would break down on the deck and send us in a jiffy to the bottom i didn't care so much about it for myself as for the brave young lads likely to be admirals one of these days but not a cry nor a word of complaint did i hear from them mr rogers maybe was the most plucky as he seemed to feel that it was his duty to set an example to his messmates and i could hear his voice every now and then as they all stood close together lashed to the starboard rigging and when the lightning flashed i could just get a glimpse of their faces looking pale as death not from fear though but contrasted as it were with the darkness around i had made myself fast you may be sure for i shouldn't have been long on the deck if i hadn't as not once but many a time a sea came tumbling over first one quarter then the other and though it was but just the top of it we should all of us have been swept overboard and if the hatches hadn't been battened down the old drodger would have gone to the bottom we had managed to light the binnacle lamp before we got from under the land and i saw by the compass that we were driving about south-east so that i had no fear of being cast on the shore of any other island and i hoped if we could weather out the gale that we might beat back to saba on we ran hour after hour it seemed to me the longest night i had ever passed since i came to sea the wonder was that the drodger still kept afloat but she was tight and light as a cork now she was on the top of one sea now climbing up the side of another one comfort was that the longest night must come to an end and that the hurricane could not last for ever we were i judged too on the skirts of it and that if we stood on we should in time get beyond its power it required pretty careful steering to keep the wind right aft for if i had brought it ever so little abeam the vessel would have gone clean over in a moment 
i was thankful you may be sure when daylight came at last not that the prospect round us was a pleasant one the big seas were rolling and leaping and tumbling about like mad on every side hissing and roaring and knocking their white heads together as if they didn't know what they would be at it was a hard job to steer clear of the worst it was often dobson's choice and many came with such a plump down on the deck that i thought after all we should be sent to davy jones's locker but the lively little craft managed to run her nose up the next mountain sea and to shake herself clear of the water just as a newfoundland dog does when he gets ashore after a swim the only pleasant sight was to see the young gentlemen standing where they had been all night and keeping up their spirits we are getting precious hungry dick sung out mr rogers i'm thinking of going below to find some grub no no just stay safe where you are sir i answered if you let go your hold maybe that moment we shall have a sea come aboard us and carry you away with it or if the companion hatch is lifted it may make its way below and swamp us all right dick we can manage to hold out for a few hours more cried the other two don't think of going tom we wouldn't have you run the risk for our sakes from the gnawings of my own stomach i knew that the poor youngsters must be very sharp set however it seemed to me that the wind was somewhat less than it had been and i hoped that in a few hours more the hurricane would be over or that we should be out of it i told them so and i soon heard them laughing and talking as if nothing particular out of the way was happening well in a couple of hours or so the wind fell and i saw that we must have the foresail set or run the chance of being pooped i told them what i wanted and casting off their lashings they all sprang together to the halyards and soon had the sail hoisted and the sheet belayed they then made their way aft now i think we've earned our breakfast says mr rogers and slipping off the companion hatch he dived below while the other two stood ready to draw it over again in case a sea should come aboard us he quickly returned with some bread meat a bottle of wine and a basket of fruit they wouldn't touch anything till they had fed me for they said i had had the hardest work and saved their lives my hands you see had still enough to do in working the tiller and my eyes too for that matter in keeping a watch on the seas so all i could do was just to open my mouth and let them put the food into it all i wanted was enough to keep body and soul together and i then advised them to get back to the shrouds and to make themselves fast as before as there was no saying what might happen while the sea was tumbling about in its present fashion you must take a swig of the wine first says mr rogers in his cheery way just like the lieutenant his brother holding the bottle to my mouth i'd got a gulp or two of the liquor keeping my weather eye open all the time when i saw an ugly big sea come rolling up on our quarter i sung out to the other two to hold fast to the companion hatch for their lives while i got a grip of mr tom between one of my arms and the tiller i couldn't avoid the sea right over us it came pouring down the still open hatchway and sweeping across the deck i had mr tom safe enough though the breath was half squeezed out of his body but i was afraid the others would have been torn from their hold like brave-hearted youngsters as they are they had held fast though over head and ears in water ah but the venison has gone on a cruise sung out mr desmond as soon as the sea had passed clear of us and some big brute of a shark will be making his breakfast of it better that he should eat that than us patty said mr rogers don't let's fret about it for to say the truth it was rather too high to be pleasant he was right as to that for the bits he put into my mouth had a very curious taste but it wasn't a time to be particular so i had taken what was given me and said nothing i was thankful when i saw that the three lads had safely lashed themselves to the starboard shrouds as before the day was wearing on and i was beginning to feel that i'd rather not have to stand on my legs much longer though the hope that the hurricane would quickly blow itself out kept me up at last i calculated about seven bells in the afternoon watch it fell almost a dead calm though we happily kept steerage way on the craft for the sea tumbled about almost as madly as before 
and it was a difficult job to prevent its breaking aboard however we managed to set the mainsail and i hoped we should soon have smoother water one can never tell what tricks the wind will play suddenly as you may see sometimes a hulking giant knock down a little chap with a blow of his fist a sea struck the drodger on the starboard beam and before a sheet could be let fly over she went it was a mercy that the three young gentlemen were holding on at the same time to the weather rigging they all scrambled in a moment on to the chains where i making my way along the bulwarks quickly joined them i can't say that they were frightened exactly but they didn't like it which was but natural no more did i what's going to happen next asked mr rogers quite calmly the hatches being on the craft won't fill and maybe when the squall has passed over another sea may right her i answered as i saw that there was a chance of that happening the squall didn't last ten minutes and directly afterwards there was a flat calm and the sea went down wonderfully fast still the drodger lay over on her side and gave no signs of writing mr desmond proposed cutting away the mast that mightn't help us i answered i've an idea that the ballast has shifted over to port and that with the water in her keeps the craft down we must wait till the sea is smooth and then we'll get the companion hatch off and have a look below we may be able to bail the water out and shift enough of the ballast to right her but as long as the sea is running it's safer to trust to providence and to hold on with hands and teeth where we are and poor spider i'm afraid he'll have an uncomfortable time of it left all alone in the dark below and not knowing what can have happened to the vessel said mr rogers as if he thought the monkey more to be pitied than himself or us the poor brute had been made fast below to keep him out of mischief when they went on shore and had remained there since i had an idea that he was very likely drowned if he was over on the lee side but i didn't say so for fear of grieving his young masters thinks i to myself if we are hard up for grub whether dead or alive he'll serve us for a meal or two at all events having no longer the steering of the craft to attend to as evening drew on i began to feel very drowsy and it made me fear that the youngsters who would be getting sleepy likewise to a certainty might drop off into the water and be drowned or be grabbed by a shark the thought had no sooner come into my head than i saw one of the brutes swimming by and casting his two wicked eyes up at us i roused myself up in a moment and getting hold of some lashings pointed him out to the young gentlemen when i told them what i feared they did not object to my making them all fast to the chains with their legs along the shrouds i afterwards secured myself close to them on the bulwarks i hadn't been there many minutes before i went off into a sort of sleep though it wasn't exactly sleep because i knew where i was and never forgot what had happened i could hear too the voices of my young companions trying by talking to keep each other awake though it was a hard job for them poor lads the seas do ye see had been washing over us all the time and even now though they broke less heavily than before pretty often nearly smothered us but even they could not make me keep my eyes open darkness soon came down upon the ocean but it was growing calmer and calmer and i could feel that the vessel was no longer tossed and tumbled about while the voices of the midshipmen ceased to sound in my ears i tried to rouse myself up that was however more than i could do and at last i dropped off into a real sound sleep when i awoke the vessel lay as quietly as in a mill-pond and not a sound was to be heard except the soft lap of the water against the hull i couldn't even hear the breathing of the midshipmen and for a moment the dreadful thought came to me that they were dead or had got loose somehow or other and had slipped into the sea i lifted myself up so that i could reach the shrouds there they were safe enough and all as fast asleep as they could have been in their hammocks i wouldn't awake them as i thought the sleep would do them good i myself had no wish to go to sleep again so i sat up watching the bright stars shining out of the clear sky and thinking whether it would be possible to get the vessel righted and if not what chance there was if we could form a raft of reaching one of the 
islands or falling in with a passing vessel to my mind a man's a coward who cries die whilst there's life in him and i determined with the help of him who i knew right well looks after poor jack to do my best to save myself and the young midshipmen these things gave me enough to think about for the rest of that long night at last the light of day came back the stars grew dim and presently the sun like a huge ball of fire with a blaze of red all around him over the sky rose out of the glass-like sea i knew that it was going to be blazing hot and that we should feel it terribly the midshipmen awaking were much surprised to find that it was light again already and couldn't believe that they had slept through the night having cast off their lashings they began to move about to stretch their cramped limbs not that there was much space for that now messmates said mr rogers there's one thing we ought to do before we think of anything else and that is to thank god for having preserved us through the night and to pray to him to protect us and to take us ashore in safety needham you'll join us i know of course i will sir says i and well pleased i was to hear the youngster speak in that way without any shamefacedness it was just what i'd been thinking for if a man dare not ask god to help him he must be in a bad way indeed without another word we all knelt on the side of the vessel and a right good honest prayer did mr rogers offer up no parson or bishop either could have prayed a better th though he might have put more words into it the young gentleman do you see knew exactly what we all wanted and that's just what he asked god to give us and no more and now needham what do you consider is the first thing we ought to do said rogers as soon as he had finished let us try and get some water sang out mr desmond i'm terribly thirsty i could drink a bucketful if i had it so could i for my thrapple is as dry as a dustbin added mr gordon as to that i am not better than either of you says mr rogers but i thought that i'd try to hold out as long as i could well says i i'll make my way below and see what i can bring up water will be better than wine or spirits and if i can find any you shall have it no no needham you stay where you are says mr rogers just pass a rope aft and i'll make it fast round my waist till i can get the hatch off the water's pretty well up to the combings already and my weight won't make the difference which yours might he seemed to think that there was more danger than i did that the weight of a single man might capsize the craft altogether i believe that if we had all gone below together it wouldn't have mattered however i did as he ordered me it was a sliding hatch you remember and he soon got it off far enough to let himself down into the cabin we all sat watching for him to come back again at last i heard his voice singing out to me to hoist away looking down i saw him seated on the companion hatch with master spider the monkey clinging to his neck while he was making fast the end of the rope to a basket full of all sorts of things which he had collected below i hauled it up and he followed with spider water water cried the others i couldn't find a drop he answered but i've brought some oranges and a bottle of wine it's the last in the locker so we must take care how we use it there was just one orange apiece and for my part i'd have given a five-pound note for mine rather than go without it as to the wine we couldn't touch it though we were glad of some before long the only solid food we had was biscuit for the fish and venison had gone bad and we were not sharp set enough to eat it but then we had besides the oranges several sorts of fruit their outlandish names i never can remember though they didn't put much strength into us they were what we wanted seeing that we had no water to moisten our throats still while they and the biscuits lasted and the monkey spider to fall back on i wasn't afraid of starving though i didn't say anything to the young gentlemen about him as i knew they wouldn't like the thoughts of feeding on their pet when we had finished our breakfast we began to talk of what we had best do we had the choice of three things to try and right the drodger to make a raft out of her spars and upper works or to sit quietly where we were till some vessel should come by and take us off at last i got leave from mr rogers to go below and judge what chance there was of righting the craft 
i soon saw that without buckets we should never be able to bail her out there wasn't one to be found nor would the pump work while as i had guessed the ballast had shifted over to the port side so till we could free her of water we couldn't reach that besides it would have been a difficult matter to get it back to its place as i was groping about in the hold i came upon two water casks here is a prize i thought but the bungs were out and the only water in them was salt at last i went back with my report then we must set to and build a raft said mr rogers nothing daunted how are we to cut away the spars and bulwarks without axes asked mr gordon it would be a hard job to do it with our knives and hands you are right my boy and faith the only thing we can do that i can see is to sit quiet and wait till providence sends us help says mr desmond quite calmly we should be thankful that the old tub keeps above water we were all agreed as to this when i came to think of it i saw that without a single axe or tool of any sort there was no hope of making a raft fit to carry tins though it had seemed possible to me in the night-time when i was half asleep the midshipman was right all we could do was to sit quiet and look out for a sail i made another trip below and got up some more biscuit and fruit and three pots of preserves which were very welcome and some nuts for a spider these we put into the basket which was secured to the rigging i then shut to the companion hatch and sat down on the bulwarks the sun soon dried out clothes but we shouldn't have minded having them wet to have escaped the heat as the sun rose in the sky it grew hotter and hotter but not a word of complaint did the young gentlemen utter all day long they sat talking to each other or amusing themselves with spider they kept him fast by his chain for fear of his slipping off the vessel's side if he had done so he would have been down the throat of a shark in an instant for the brutes had found us out and i saw half a score at a time cruising round the wreck as if they expected a feast before long it wasn't pleasant and i couldn't help sometimes thinking that they would not be disappointed i kept my eye turning round the horizon in the hopes of seeing the signs of a breeze which might bring up a vessel to our help i looked in vain the ocean shone like a sheet of glass not a cat's paw even for a moment played over its surface we ate but little even the fruit did not take away our thirst it was water we wanted and without it the rum of which we had plenty was of no use it tasted like fire when we put it to our lips so that the young gentleman would not touch it the scorching day came to an end at last the night gave us some relief and then mr rogers served out half a glass of wine to each of us with our biscuit and fruit we made ourselves fast to the rigging as we had done the night before and the midshipmen went to sleep with spider nestling down among them just as if they had been accustomed to it all their lives before i could close my eyes i made certain that they were secure i don't mean to say that they slept all the night through i several times heard them talking and even joking trying to keep up each other's spirits and then they would get drowsy and go to sleep and then rouse up again and have another yarn i couldn't sleep many minutes together for i couldn't help thinking of what might befall the poor young gentleman if the calm was to continue for the fruit was spoiling we had only an orange apiece for the next morning and the wine and dry biscuit without water wouldn't keep life in them many hours while another day's sun was striking down on their heads i might hold out long after they were gone this was the thing that troubled me i couldn't lie quiet and i was every ten minutes getting up and looking round though i knew well enough that without wind no vessel could come near us towards morning i fell asleep for a longer spell i was awoke by the sun coming into my eyes and looking round what should i see but master spider sitting close to the basket of provisions sucking away at an orange in his paws i shouted out to the rascal who only looked up and grinned and chattered as much as to say i want my breakfast as much as you do my voice awoke his masters who starting up saw what their friend was about the rascal had already eaten two of our precious oranges and had just begun a third 
when mr rogers took it from him master spider seemed to think he was very hardly treated and grinned and chattered and tried to get hold of it again there's no use punishing the poor brute said the young gentleman he only acted according to his nature and of course he thinks that he has as much right to the fruit as we have only he ought not to have taken more than his proper share those two oranges with some biscuits served us for breakfast and after that except the remainder of the wine and some rum we hadn't a drop of liquid to drink the sea was as calm and the sun as hot as the day before and we all soon became fearfully thirsty unable to bear it longer i again went below to have another search for water i looked into every locker i hunted through the hold and examined every hole and corner in the forepeak but to no purpose i discovered however what made me more uneasy than ever that the water was leaking in through the deck it came in very slowly but i had marked a line when i was down before and i found since then that it had risen nearly half an inch i couldn't hide from myself that the vessel was sinking i said nothing about it to the young gentleman when having shut the hatch i climbed back to my place it went to my heart to hear them still joking and laughing in spite of their hunger and thirst when i thought that in two or three days at furthest their merry voices would be silenced by death they didn't keep up their joking long for as the sun got higher the heat became greater and roasted out their spirits as it were poor fellows in spite of what each one in turn did to keep them up spider was the only one of the party who was as merry as ever for the heat didn't hurt him and he kept frisking about to the end of his chain trying when he thought he was not watched to get at the basket to see if there were any more oranges or any other fruit to his taste in it well needham don't you think matters will mend soon says mr rogers to me seeing that i had been sitting silent and downcast for a long time we surely shall have a breeze before the evening and some craft or other coming to look for us for the life of me i couldn't say yes i shook my head i was beginning to lose all hope at noon mr rogers served out half a glass of wine to each of us and some biscuit this put a little more life into me and i again took to thinking whether we could form a raft with the bulkheads and lining of the cabin which we might tear away by main strength and the two empty water casks and the hatches and the gaff and boom the job would be to lash them together for though we might stand on the bulwarks which were under water there would be no small danger of being carried off by the sharks swarming round us at all events if the craft was to sink as i made no doubt she would we should have a struggle for life instead of going down with her and being eaten up by the sharks it cost me a good deal to say it but at last i told the young gentleman that i was sure the vessel wouldn't float much longer and what i proposed doing don't let us lose any time about doing it then says mr rogers jumping up as brisk as possible we'll get the two casts from below and lash the stoutest pieces of board we can tear from the bulkheads on the top of them this will make a small raft and i will go out on it and cut away the gaff and get out the topmast while he was speaking i saw him turn his eye to the eastward see see there comes the breeze and look yes i am sure of it a sail a sail he was right just rising above the dark blue line which marked the coming breeze where the royals of a vessel standing directly towards us her topgallant sails quickly appeared and in a short time we could see halfway down her topsails we were so eagerly watching her that we forgot all about the raft we had intended putting together the young gentleman made no doubt that the stranger would pass close to us but i had my fears that low down as we were we might not be seen this made me sorry that we had not built the small raft that one of us might paddle off to the stranger should she seem as if about to pass at any moderate distance from us as there was still time i made my way below to bring up the casks as i was feeling for them in the hole my leg struck against a pretty long spar 
i hauled it out and handed it up to the midshipman this will serve as a signal staff i said it will give us a good chance of being seen by the stranger and i'll try to find a flag the drogher's ensign was in an after locker we soon made it fast to the spar which we then set up by this time we could see that the stranger was a brig and unless she altered her course that she would not pass very far from us on she quickly came cat's paws were already playing over the smooth water presently the breeze itself struck our cheeks how cool and pleasant it felt hunger and thirst were forgotten the midshipmen tried to shout their hollow voices showed how much they had suffered i wasn't quite so happy as they were for it seemed to me that the brig would pass not much short of a mile from us and that we might not after all be seen i couldn't help saying so sooner than that i'll swim off to her says mr rogers you forget the sharks sir i answered just then the brig altering her course stood directly for us we were seen of that there could be no doubt we all stood up and waved and shouted at the top of our voices even spider who sprang up on the shoulders of mr rogers seemed to understand that there was something in the wind and chattered and grinned with delight the brig was a large rakish craft with a black hull and as i looked at her i had some doubts about her character it struck me indeed that she was the same wicked-looking vessel i had seen come into english harbour the day we sailed in the drogher however we couldn't be worse off aboard her than we were and i could suppose that any human beings would leave us to perish before long she let fly her top-gallant sails and royals clued up her topsails and courses and a boat was lowered which pulled towards us we must not leave our change of clothes behind us says mr gordon my carpet-bag is in the starboard berth i'll get the bags for you young gentlemen says i for i did not like to trust any of them below again for fear of accidents i jumped down as i said this and by the time after groping about for them i had got hold of the three bags the boat was alongside jump in my lads sung out the mate in charge of her we have no time to stop the young gentleman and master spider had scrambled down into her we are not going without needham though they all sang out together just as i got my head up the companion hatch what is there another of you said the mate be smart my man or i must leave you behind thank you sir but i would rather go says i as i made a leap into the boat with the carpet-bags just as the bowman was shoving off while we were pulling for the brig the mate asked how we came to be there mr rogers told him in a few words i heard say in english harbour that you were supposed to be lost he observed i was then sure that the brig was the craft i had seen there we were soon alongside who should we see as we stepped on deck but the old colonel and his daughter and the little black girl polly who came with us from trinidad they seemed mightily pleased at finding that we were not drowned especially the young lady who told the midshipmen how anxious every one on board the frigate had been about them mr rogers had to go over the whole story again it's pleasant to find that we are of some account in the world says mr desmond in his off-hand irish way but if you please miss o'regan we are as hungry as hounds and as thirsty as hippopotami and i'm sure you'll say a good word to get us something to eat and drink bless my heart exclaimed the colonel i forgot my boys that you had been hanging on to the drogher's bottom for the last three days on short allowance yes sir says i thinking it was as well to speak on my own account for he didn't seem to understand that i had been with them the young gentleman and i had nothing to stow away in our insides all that time but hardtack and rotten fruit you shall have supper then this moment my lads says the colonel and having shouted to the steward to put some food on the table he invited the midshipmen to go below and i hope this poor man who has suffered as much as they have may come too says the young lady and i blessed her sweet face as she spoke of course says the colonel he might fare but badly forward the skipper a dark-looking chap who had been walking the deck all the time scarcely stopping to welcome us aboard looked daggers at me but i didn't mind him 
come along needham you saved our lives and should be the first attended to says mr rogers kindly to me i of course know my place and that it isn't for the likes of me to sit down to table with my betters but just then if the queen herself had asked me to take a snack with her i'd have said yes marm please your ladyship with the greatest pleasure in the world the steward soon had all sorts of good things on the table but there was one above all others i wanted most and that was a big jug of water i could have put it to my mouth and drained it dry the young gentlemen filled up their tumblers and passed on the jug to me stop says the colonel you shall temper the water with claret but before he could finish speaking the glasses were drained dry we held them out again however and the colonel and the young lady filled them up half and half with wine and water this brought back our appetites and we turned to with a will the colonel's daughter filling up our plates with a smile to watch how we ate when i'd had enough i got up and made my bow and the colonel told the steward to get me a berth somewhere as he was sure i should be glad to turn in and take a snooze he was right for my eyes were winking and the young gentlemen were pretty nigh asleep in their chairs there were two spare cabins and they were in them with their eyes shut before i had made my last scrape and bow at the cuddy door the steward told me to turn into his cot and it didn't take me long before i was as sound asleep as i ever was in my life when i turned out the next morning i found that the young gentlemen were still snoozing away they didn't turn out till noon and even then they kept rubbing their eyes as if they hadn't had enough sleep yet otherwise they seemed in no way the worse for what they had gone through in the meantime the young lady had sent for me aft and asked all sorts of questions about our cruise which mr rogers hadn't told her and spoke ever so kindly to me i thought as she was talking that there wasn't anything in the world i wouldn't do for her the colonel also had his say and after telling me that he was sure i was a brave trustworthy fellow asked me should i like to go ashore with him and assist him in an adventure he had in hand i answered that though i liked a spree on shore as well as others that it was my duty to stick by the three young gentlemen to look after them and to see them safe aboard the frigate again by the first opportunity he seemed somewhat taken aback and said nothing more the dark-looking skipper captain crowhurst they called him hadn't as much as spoken to me nor had the mate and it's my belief that if it hadn't been for the colonel and his daughter they would have left us to perish on the wreck there was something i didn't like in either of them and i made sure that they were about no good after i had spoken my mind to the colonel he didn't seem quite as friendly as at first though his daughter was just the same the young gentlemen made themselves happy as they were sure to do with plenty of grub and no watch to keep the skipper however told me that as i couldn't be kept for nothing i must go forward and do duty of course i said yes sir it's what i'm always ready for i managed to make friends with the ship's company though they were a rough lot of blacks browns and whites and while i remained aboard i worked as hard as any of them we had fine weather with light winds and in about a fortnight we sighted this here coast all the time we hadn't fallen in with any vessel bound for jamaica or indeed any english craft instead of steering for cartagena or one of the larger places we put into a small harbour called sapote some miles away from the chief town i forgot to say that the day after we were taken off the wreck we had fallen in with a sloop the billy which kept company with us and now anchored astern of the brig the skipper of the billy came aboard and from the way he and the colonel and captain crowhurst talked i guessed that there was something in the wind as soon as it was dark a boat from the shore came off bringing an officer-like looking spaniard who shook hands with the colonel as if they were old friends the colonel introduced the skipper to the stranger and after another long talk we were ordered to get up a number of cases from the hold and to lower them into the boat alongside two of our boats with one from the sloop were then got ready with their crews all armed the colonel and the stranger went in one of them and the two skippers in the other leaving the mate in charge just as they were ready to shove off the colonel and his daughter came on deck followed by the three midshipmen 
oh father may heaven protect you but i cannot help trembling for the danger you run i heard the young lady say no danger at all he answered in a cheery tone and i am sure that my three young friends here will take very good care of you that we will that we will they all cried out together and thinks i to myself and so will i as long as i've an arm to strike with or a head to think what to do away the boats pulled into the darkness there wasn't a light to be seen on shore indeed there didn't appear to be many houses thereabouts mr rogers came on deck again after the young lady and they had gone below i am sorry to find the brig engaged in this sort of work he said there is to be a rebellion or something of that sort on shore and if the colonel is caught it will be a serious matter for him and what is worse still for his daughter what do you think of it needham what you do sir says i i wish that he was safe aboard again and that we were on our way back to jamaica but i don't think the skipper is likely to steer northward till he has landed the whole of his cargo and a good portion of it consists of arms and warlike stores while we were talking the mate came aft and asked mr rogers somewhat rudely if he was going to take charge of the deck while he ordered me forward i shall be very happy if you wish it said mr rogers maybe if you do the ship will run away with you my lad said the mate with a sneer i didn't hear more but i saw mr rogers walking the deck quite as if he didn't mind what the mate had said and was officer of the watch it was my opinion from the way the skipper and first mate behaved to the young gentleman and me that they wanted us to leave the ship so that we might not be spies on their actions i waited till i saw the first mate go below and the second mate come on deck he was a quiet sort of young man and he and mr rogers were on friendly terms i then went aft they seemed anxious from what they were saying about the colonel not coming back by that time while they were talking the young lady with polly came on deck and heard some of their remarks before they knew she was near them oh mr rogers do you really think the people on shore will interfere with my father she asked he surely ought to have returned by this time we are expecting him every moment miss o'regan answered mr rogers putting her off as it were and not wishing to say what he thought all seems perfectly quiet on shore the other young gentlemen had followed her on deck and they all three tried to persuade her to go below again telling her that they were afraid she might suffer from the night air still she stood looking out towards the shore but no lights were seen and no sound of oars could we hear at last mr rogers said just as if he was a grown man you know miss o'regan that the colonel put you under our charge and we must respectfully insist on your going below you may suffer from the night air coming off the shore and you cannot hasten the colonel's return by remaining on deck we will let you know immediately he appears or that we can get tidings of him if it had been lieutenant rogers or the captain himself saying this neither of them could have spoken more firmly i will do as you advise and trust to your promise said the young lady and she and her maid went below helped down the companion ladder by mr gordon and mr desmond after this one or the other was constantly coming on deck sent by miss o'regan to learn if the boats were returning i felt somehow as if all was not right and i could not bring myself to leave mr rogers who didn't go below all night except for a few minutes to get supper End of section thirteen section fourteen of the three lieutenants this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the three lieutenants by william henry giles kingston chapter twelve needham's narrative continued the sarah jane captured by cartagenian fleet the colonel and his daughter with the midshipmen conveyed on board the enemy's corvette carried to prison in cartagena the colonel separated from his daughter stella and the midshipmen with needham placed in an upper room the jailer's wife 
plans for escaping desmond and needham get out reach the consulate alarm in the household obtain a boat and go in search of the consul driven out to sea the night i was speaking of seemed almost as long as those we spent on the wreck just at dawn the first mate came on deck no sign of the boats yet he asked in an anxious tone yes i hear them exclaimed mr rogers and after listening for a minute or so to be sure that he was right he went below to tell miss o'regan she and the three midshipmen were presently on deck the boats are pulling very fast you'll soon have the colonel on board said mr rogers to the young lady as she stood eagerly looking towards the shore where we could as yet see nothing on account of the mist which still hung over it a good reason they have for coming fast i suspect suddenly cried the first mate who was turning an eye to the offing the darkness of night had then pretty nearly rolled away what do any of you fancy those craft are out there why says i i make out a ship and a brig and a couple of schooners the first are men of war i judge by the squareness of their yards and they are standing for the harbour they have been creeping along shore with the land wind during the night or they wouldn't be where they are the second mate agreed with me i don't see what cause we have to fear them seeing that england is at peace with all the world says i to him i do though if they belong to the cartagenian government he answered i wish we were well out of the harbour that i do while we were watching the strangers captain crowhurst came alongside in his gig and almost before he was on deck he shouted out hands aloft loose sails stand by to slip the cable no time for weighing oh where is my father i heard the young lady ask him he'll be here soon i suppose he answered gruffly and turning away he muttered if it hadn't been for his obstinacy we should have been well out at sea by this time the few hands sprang aloft to loose sails the skipper went to the helm and the mate stood ready to unshackle the cable while the gig's crew hoisted up their boat i really thought that captain crowhurst was going to sail without waiting for the colonel i heard him order the midshipmen who were talking together to lend a hand in getting the ship under way if they didn't wish to be run up to the yard arm the poor young lady was in a state of great agitation at seeing what was happening we will not touch a rope till the colonel is on board says mr rogers he is our friend and will not allow him to be basely deserted we are not under your command either if it comes to that at this the skipper swore fearfully and seizing a rope's end seemed as if he would have given a taste of it to the midshipmen all round when the young lady stepping before him told him that he was a coward and dared him to strike them he went back to the wheel without answering i had been keeping a lookout for the boats daylight was increasing and i now saw them coming off the men bending to their oars as if they were in chase of an enemy they soon dashed up alongside and the colonel came on deck looking as cool as if nothing particular had happened though by the way the men sprang on board and hauled away at the falls and then turned to at loosing sails i judged that they knew there was no time to be lost the cable was let run out the sails were sheeted home and with a light breeze off the land we stood out of the harbour followed by the sloop i saw the colonel talking to his daughter who seemed terribly alarmed but he laughed and looked at the strangers about two miles off on the starboard bow and then he pointed ahead as if he expected to get out of the harbour before they were up to us i had my doubts however whether we should the midshipmen then came up to him as i supposed to say how glad they were that he had got safe on board he answered them very shortly and taking the young lady by the hand led her below soon afterwards mr rogers came forward to where i was standing 
i suspect needham that the colonel has got into some scrape on shore said he it is clear from that officer coming off to her that the brig was expected on the coast and probably those men of war are sent to overhaul her do you think that we shall get out to sea before they come up with us and if we don't can we beat them off to be honest with you mr rogers i don't think that there's much chance of our escaping them and as to beating them off even if the fellows aboard here would fight we couldn't do it unless they take fright at the sound of our pop-guns i answered we must try to frighten them at all events he said it won't do to let a band of ruffians come aboard and frighten miss o'regan and perhaps carry off the colonel if they have any accusation against him i told him that must depend on what the spaniards knew about the brig it wasn't likely that two men of war could be frightened off by a merchantman though we had four guns and might put a bold face on the matter the other midshipmen now came forward and stood with us watching the strangers there was a chance but only just a chance that we should escape them the skipper and the mate seemed to be in a great taking the corvette was coming up fast and the brig of war not far astern of her carrying all the sail they could set the breeze still held the corvette by this time was about a mile and a half away on our starboard bow the skipper began to look as if we should do it and i thought so too when just then our sails began to hang down and presently flapped loudly against the masts the skipper gave a stamp with his foot on the deck and swore a loud oath there we lay becalmed while the corvette and brig still felt the wind off the land it's all up with us i'm afraid said i to mr rogers it's high time to show our teeth he answered captain crowhurst you'll fight those fellows if they attempt to board us won't you he said going up to the skipper if you will run all the guns over to starboard we can give them a broadside which ten to one will make them sheer off rather than get a further taste of our quality the skipper smiled grimly but suppose they don't sheer off depend on it they will cut the throats of every one of us when they come aboard what do you say to that my young gentleman i'd run the risk rather than let the ruffians take the vessel from us answered mr rogers turning away to speak to the colonel who had that moment come on deck he looked up at the canvas hanging idly down against the masts and then at the strangers still creeping up towards us the wind was leaving them as it had us and he saw in a moment how matters stood mr rogers told him that he and the other midshipmen were ready to fight and defend the brig to the last you're brave lads he answered i thank you heartily if captain crowhurst thinks there's a chance of beating them off we'll risk it but otherwise for the sake of my daughter it would be dangerous to make the attempt it's for her sake sir that we are anxious to fight answered mr rogers captain crowhurst will your crew support you asked the colonel of the skipper who had just gone up to him i doubt it he answered the fellows are brave enough but the odds are fearfully against us i'll speak to them and learn what humour they are in you'll understand i'd gone aft with the midshipmen the skipper went forward and we saw him speaking to the crew who were clustered together talking among each other in my opinion the skipper himself hadn't much fighting in him bold and blustering as he seemed while he was forward the young lady came on deck she judged by the midshipmen's countenances that something was wrong though her father looked as stern and determined as usual 
i fear that you will be put to some inconvenience he said those men of war i suspect are sent to overhaul the brig and becalmed as we are we cannot escape them but i am very sure that our young friends here will defend you from insult and our enemies may be satisfied if they can get hold of the captain and me that we will said all the midshipmen together oh my father do not let me be separated from you where you go i will accompany you said miss o'regan but i hope that the colonel will not have to go anywhere exclaimed mr rogers we must drive the fellows off if they attempt to board the brig i thank you for your zeal and courage young gentlemen said the colonel you see stella that you have brave defenders i wish you to go below and rest assured that we will do all that possibly can be done to secure your safety but i am thinking about your safety father said miss o'regan i have been too often in danger to be anxious about that he answered go below and we'll let you know as soon as possible what is likely to happen without saying another word the young lady did as the colonel told her i had been watching the men forward and i soon saw by their looks that there was no fighting in them presently three or four of them slipped below the others after saying a few more words to the skipper followed and i then knew that they had made up their minds not to fight they had gone to put on their best clothes and to stow their money away in their pockets guessing that if the spaniards boarded us they would to a certainty plunder the vessel the skipper came aft looking very downcast the men won't fight and we must make the best of a bad bargain he said to the colonel there's no chance of a breeze and see the corvette and brig are lowering their boats and we shall have the fellows aboard us in a few minutes the sloop lay becalmed close to us her skipper captain judson came aboard and walked about the deck like a madman those fellows will hang every mother's son of us he cried out pulling off his hat and tearing away at his hair what a fool i was to engage in this sort of work colonel o'regan can't you advise us what we are to do you knew the risk and you and i must take the consequences answered the colonel quite coolly i can only advise you to act like brave men whatever our enemies chance to do with us don't let them have cause to treat us with contempt as neither the young gentleman nor i had more clothes than those on our backs we weren't troubled at what we should lose but for the colonel and the skipper and mates it was a very different matter they might not only lose their property and the cargo but their lives were in no little danger i guess from what i heard them say the boats came towards us five from the corvette and three from the brig as they got near i saw that the men were laying on their oars as if they expected we should fight you see we had the english flag flying at our peak and they knew pretty well that englishmen are not inclined to give in without striking a blow i thought that the colonel and the skipper would have acted very differently but they knew that they were not altogether right and that made them knock under in the way they would not otherwise have done when the boats came within musket shot the men lay on their oars as if they expected should they come nearer that we should fire on them the officers seemed to be consulting together and then they made up their minds to attack us and came on altogether in a line if our crew had consented to fight it would have been pretty tough work i must own that and maybe we should have got the worst of it in a few minutes the boats were alongside and their crews were clambering up on deck some on our quarters and some amidships and forward shouting and jabbering and waving their cutlasses as if we had been defending ourselves whereas there was not a man among us had a weapon in his hand 
i thought in truth they were going to cut down every one of us so they would have done if the colonel hadn't shouted out in their own lingo and told them if they came as friends they should be received as friends and that we did not wish to oppose them one of the officers who had been longer getting up the side than the rest seeing that he was too fat to move quickly now stepped up to the colonel and told him to give up his sword and consider himself a prisoner the colonel answered that he didn't wear a sword at sea that he was an englishman sailing aboard an english vessel and that if they took him or any one else prisoners they must stand the consequence the spaniard stamped and swore and looked very big and called him a pirate and then pointed at the midshipman and told him that he was bringing up young pirates and that they should all be hung together the colonel instead of getting into a rage was very polite and said that he was mistaken that the midshipman belonged to a british man-of-war had been picked up off a wreck and that if any harm was done to them their ships would come and punish him and all concerned i was told this afterwards for though the spanish officer spoke a little english i didn't understand all they were talking about the officer however didn't mind what the colonel said but calling his men they made a rush at him and taking him unawares seized him and held him fast others in the meantime had got hold of the skipper and mates as you see the enemy were five to one of us but still it's my opinion if our men had been staunch we could have beat them off they didn't touch either of the midshipmen or me for they believed what the colonel had told them having got the colonel down they lashed his arms behind him and made him sit upon the deck he took things very calmly and calling mr rogers to him he said i'll thank you now to go and look after my daughter i know that i can trust you my young friend don't alarm her more than is necessary and beg her to remain below until you think she will be safe on deck ay ay sir said mr rogers and he and his messmates dived into the cabin i remained on deck for a few minutes longer to see what was likely to happen the people who boarded us were of all colours spaniards mulattoes and blacks and browns of every hue though they spoke the same lingo and were as savage-looking villains as i ever set eyes on with their sharp knives stuck in their belts which they seemed only too eager to use finding themselves masters of the brig they made their way below and laid hands on everything to which they took a fancy thinking that i might help the young gentleman i slipped down the companion hatch and found them standing before miss o'regan's cabin they had armed themselves with pistols and cutlasses glad to see you needham said mr rogers you'll find a brace of pistols in the captain's cabin and here's a cutlass we have made up our minds to fight as long as there's fight in us if the ruffians attempt to hurt the young lady i'm one with you young gentlemen said i and i went and got the pistols miss o'regan heard what he said and opened the door begging them not to fight as there would be no use in doing so scarcely had she spoken when down came a gang of rough-looking villains with those long knives of theirs in their hands looking very ferocious and ready to kill any who might dare to stop them mr rogers had just time to push the young lady back into the cabin and shut the door before the fellows could see her they didn't take much notice of the midshipmen but set about hunting through the other cabins at last they came to the one in which miss o'regan and polly were no no my fine fellows you're not to go in there said mr rogers standing in front of the door and holding his pistols ready to fire the other midshipmen did the same and i held a firm grip of my cutlass determined to cut down the first of the ruffians who attempted to pass should the midshipmen's pistols miss fire the spaniards flourished their long knives and swore all sorts of strange oaths in their own lingo but didn't like to advance a step knowing that two or three of them would get a bullet through their heads we had the best of it as long as we had pistols and they had only knives 
three or four fellows who had been hunting in the other cabins now however came up with pistols in their belts and drawing them swore that they would shoot us if we didn't drop our arms it would have gone hard with us as there were but three boys and one grown man opposed to a dozen or more of the spaniards when just at that moment down came the fat officer who commanded the boats we had heard him as i said speak a little english to the colonel and so mr rogers told him that we were only wishing to protect the young lady from insult i appeal to your honour sir as a spaniard and an officer to assist us in defending her and i feel sure sir that you will do so said he you are not mistaken young sir answered the officer i will take care that the lady is not insulted if she will remain in her cabin he then turned to the men and ordered them on deck they went after a little grumbling each fellow laden with as much booty as he could carry he then told mr rogers to inform the young lady to prepare with the rest of the passengers to go on board the corvette as the brig and sloop were to be sent back into the harbour pray tell the officer that if my father is to go i will gladly accompany him she answered in a few minutes miss o'regan and her black servant girl polly had got ready and packed up a few things they thought they would be allowed to carry in a short time the officer who had gone on deck returned and making a polite bow said that he was sorry to inconvenience her but that the boats were manned and about to shove off for the corvette then turning to the midshipmen and me ordered us to follow him on deck we found that the colonel had already been lowered into one of the boats with the two skippers and mates the officer handed miss o'regan and polly down into the boat and placed her alongside her father we kept close to them the spanish crew who were now in charge of the vessel turned no very friendly glances at us and i saw several of the villains clutch their knives as if they would like to stick them into our backs as we passed in a few minutes we were alongside the corvette the commanding officer who seemed to consider himself a very great man indeed received us on the quarter-deck he bowed politely to the young lady but spoke roughly to the colonel and the rest of us after hearing the account the fat officer gave of the midshipmen he told us we might remain with miss o'regan if we pleased but the rest of the party were made to sit down between the guns with a guard over them the boats now brought the crews of the brig and sloop on board with their arms lashed behind their backs the men growled and grumbled as may be supposed but the spaniards showed them the points of their knives and told them to keep silent poor miss o'regan looked very downcast though the midshipmen did their best to keep up her spirits by telling her that they were sure the spaniards would not dare to hurt her or any of us let them bluster and threaten as they might the spanish officers were polite enough and begged her to go into the cabin and take some refreshment but she refused to leave the deck unless her father was allowed to accompany her they however brought her a chair which she was thankful to sit down on while the midshipmen who looked upon themselves as her guard stood around her as soon as the sea breeze set in sail was made and the corvette followed by the brig and schooners stood away for the harbour of cartagena while the sarah jane and sloop put back into the bay we reached cartagena in the afternoon and brought up before the town as soon as the anchor was dropped the commodore went on shore to communicate with the government and to learn what he was to do with his prisoners some time before nightfall he came back and he gave orders that we were all to be landed forthwith and marched up to the common jail so i made this out from what the fat officer said to the young gentlemen no one was allowed to speak to the colonel not even his own daughter as soon as she found that her father was to be taken on shore she begged to accompany him and the midshipmen said they would go too of course i went with them 
the brig and schooners in the meantime had run higher up the harbour the boats were at once manned the fat officer who was i have a notion the first lieutenant of the corvette took charge of the young lady and us she begged so hard that the colonel might come in the same boat that our friend who wasn't a bad sort of chap after all said he would speak to the commodore he pressed the point and the colonel was placed in our boat he didn't speak much in truth i suspect he had but little to say that was likely to comfort his daughter while he knew that the officer was listening all the time she asked him in a trembling voice if he thought that his life was in danger and said that she would go and plead for him with general carmona who commanded the troops in the city on no account answered the colonel it would be useless and you would only be exposing yourself to insult speaking very low so that he could not be overheard he told her to get one of the midshipmen to escape if possible to the british consul as he would be better able than any one else to help him as soon as we landed we were marched up together to the prison the young lady being compelled to walk with the midshipmen and me alongside her the colonel and skippers followed and then came the crew while the people rushed out of their houses and gathered in the streets to stare at us some shouting and abusing us and calling us pirates and all sorts of names in their lingo i didn't care what they said but walked along with my head upright looking on every side as if i was there for my own pleasure the prison was a dirty tumble-down looking sort of a place and says i i hope they are not going to put the young lady in there but they were though they allowed her a room to herself with one close to it for the midshipmen and me i was allowed to be with them because they said i was their attendant and that they required my services though not exactly as the spaniard fancied the colonel though they saw he was a thorough gentleman was thrust in with the skippers and the crew into a low dirty room paved with stone with stout iron bars to the small windows there were already a score or more of rough-looking ruffians in it this we saw as we passed by before we were taken to our own room in an upper story as many as could get to the windows which looked out into the street hung out old caps or baskets at the end of sticks to receive money or food which the people outside might give them the window of our room was strongly barred and so was that of miss o'regan but there was a door between the two which we found we could open and so she and the young gentleman were able to consult what to do the furniture of our room hadn't much to boast of our beds were only heaps of straw with bits of sacking on the top there was no table and only some rough benches to sit on miss o'regan was very little better off she had a sort of bed and chair and a heap of straw for polly but after a time the jailer's wife i suppose she was brought her a basin of water and a few other things but that was all the spaniards boasted politeness made them think of providing her she tried to interest the old woman to see if anything could be done for the colonel but the dame said that it was as much as her place was worth to interfere and she couldn't say a word to give the young lady any hope that he would be better treated when it was light we made an examination of the bars in the windows to see if we could by any means get through them those in our room were too strongly fixed to be moved in a hurry though we might have done it in time miss o'regan found one in hers which was looser than the rest and mr rogers and i on examining it discovered that it was so eaten away with rust that by hauling at it together we might wrench it out what we wanted was to get free and to go and find the british consul the window looked into a yard surrounded by a high wall but what was behind we couldn't tell the bar once out we could we thought lower ourselves into the yard the wall we might easily scale as it was full of big holes worn by time and it would not cost us much to climb over it i have a file in my knife said mr gordon it's a small one but if we use it carefully it will cut through the bar in time 
the lower part of the bar we found was almost eaten away with rust we agreed that the first thing was to scrape it clear of the rust with the blades of our knives and let the file do the rest we were afraid however to begin till all in the prison was quiet we could hear the warders walking about and talking loudly and one now and then passed our door so that we could not tell if one was going to look in on us or not at last a fellow came bringing a jug of water and a bowl of greasy rice with some bits of meat in it and a loaf of brown bread he made us understand that it was for us i hope you're going to give the young lady something better than this said mr rogers pointing to miss o'regan's room you'll understand that when we heard him coming we had got back into our own room and had shut the door see see he said nodding his head and so we hoped that it was all right though the food was coarse we were not sorry to get it as we had had nothing to eat all day and at first we thought they were going to starve us outright there was only one wooden spoon for all of us the young gentleman laughed and said that didn't matter as it was given us so that we might each get our fair allowance we heard the old woman come back into the young lady's room and when she was gone mr rogers knocked and asked if he might come in and he found when polly opened the door that the dame had brought them some pastry and fruit and some white bread and a bottle of wine and we knew from that they were not going to ill-treat them at all events in the meantime we talked over what was to be done at last it was agreed that mr desmond should go with me and that we should try to find our way to the british consuls the first night we could get out we concluded that it would take some time to file through the bar and we did not expect to get free for at least several nights to come the young lady told us that she and polly would keep watch and would let us know when we might come in to do the work in the meantime we lay down on our beds of straw for as we hadn't been to sleep the night before we could with difficulty keep our eyes open nor had she for that matter but her anxiety on account of her father made her wakeful at last she knocked at the door and i stood up and awoke mr rogers we went in as softly as we could and began working away at the bar polly and miss o'regan watching at the door to listen if any one was coming we soon got the rust off but mr gordon's file made very slow progress we worked while they watched when daylight came at last we found that we had not got through more than the tenth of an inch still that was something to prevent what we had been doing being discovered we covered the marks of the file with rust stuck on by some grease which we got from our bowl i must cut my yarn short one day was much like another still we could not learn anything about the poor colonel and the rest of the prisoners except that they were kept shut up below what the cartagenians were going to do with them and us we could not tell there was one advantage in the delay for if we had got away the first night the guard would have been on the lookout and we should have probably been caught it was bad enough for us but much worse for the poor young lady we worked on and on night after night till at last we had got almost through the bar and i felt sure that with a good haul i could wrench it on one side wide enough to get through the old woman who came up every day to see miss o'regan spoke more kindly than usual to her and called her a poor girl in her own lingo and seemed to pity her this made the young lady ask her why she spoke thus and at last she confessed that she was afraid that general carmona was going to shoot some of the english prisoners and very likely the old colonel among them this made the young lady cry out and we could hear her speaking in such woeful tones that at last mr rogers went in and asked what was the matter he then learnt all what i have just told you oh can nothing be done to save my father she exclaimed as she clasped her hands together the old woman then said that the only way would be to send a letter to the british consul but it would be dangerous for her to do so as it might cost her her life or at all events her husband his place if it was discovered that she had carried it 
at last she agreed to try and let polly out and at the same time told her which way she was to take to find the consul's house it was not more than ten minutes walk from the prison first she was to turn to the right and then cross a large square and to turn down the first street on the left at the end of which was the house she was to look for the arms of england painted over the door at all events if polly does not find it we shall the old woman has helped us more than she thinks observed mr rogers polly was ready to run every risk to serve her mistress the difficulty was to get a letter written as we had no paper pens nor ink but i have a pocket-book said mr gordon and a few words on a leaf explained our situation we of course didn't tell the old woman our own plan and we thought that by letting her do as she proposed that we might throw her husband off his guard at last she went away saying that she would try and see what she could do polly got ready to start after some time the old woman came back saying that her husband would not consent to anything of the sort we all pretended on this to be very downcast miss o'regan was really so as she thought the old woman's plan was the safest at last all was quiet polly as usual took her post at the door mr rogers and i worked away at the bar now one strong pull and we'll have it out i whispered and hauling away with all my strength i broke it off at the bottom and wrenched it on one side we made a rope of the rugs which covered our beds long enough to let me lower myself into the yard mr desmond was down directly after me and i caught him in my arms and bolted away to the opposite side of the wall as quick as lightning then i lifted him on my shoulders and he soon scrambled on to the top of the wall it was a harder job for me to follow seeing that he put his hands and feet into holes which were not big enough for mine we had hit the very place we should have chosen for just below us was a heap of rubbish which came some way up the wall and we were now on the outside of the prison mr desmond scrambled down in the same way that he got up keep still he said in a low voice don't drop don't drop there are broken pots and pans of all sorts you may cut yourself he spoke just in time for it would have been a queer place to fall on the night was pretty dark and no one was about we stopped to listen and not a sound was to be heard so we crept along the wall till we turned the corner and found ourselves in front of the prison if there was a sentry he was fast asleep in his box for we were not challenged we soon had crossed the square the old woman had told us of then we ran on as fast as our legs could carry us till we reached the consul's house which we knew by a big board over the door though we couldn't see the arms mr desmond went up to the door and pulled the bell it's no time to stand on ceremony though it's not the hour that the consul generally receives visitors i fancy he said with a laugh he pulled and pulled again i must climb in at the window if we can't awake them any other way though maybe i shall be shot if i do he added looking up to see if there was one he could reach do you need em just lift me up on your shoulders and i am sure i can reach that balcony and it will be hard if i don't get a window open and once in the house i'll go round and knock at all the doors till i rouse up some one no sooner said than done the midshipman disappeared over my head and i was left standing below wondering what next would happen i knew from the sounds which reached me that he was trying one window after another at last i heard a loud crash which showed that he had got through some way or other again all was silent presently there came cries and squealing and shouts through the lattice which there always is in spanish doors so that the people from within may talk to any one outside without opening them then there came a man's gruff voice and mr desmond's talking away as fast as his tongue could move trying to explain what it all meant this went on for some time till the gruff voice grew calmer and mr desmond began to talk slower and i heard women's and girls voices uttering all sorts of exclamations says i to myself it's all right now 
at last the door opened and mr desmond told me to come in that he was thankful to say that the vice-consul would do all he could and that the consul himself had gone away to a place a mile or two along the coast then the best thing we can do is to go after him said mr desmond can you find us a boat and a crew sir he asked of the vice-consul that will be a difficult thing young sir he answered a boat may be found but no crew would go without the permission of the general well then if you will find us a boat we will go alone said mr desmond and if the place is only a mile or two off and you will instruct us how to find it we can have no difficulty in doing so this idea seemed to please the vice-consul who though he spoke english was not an englishman he would have acted i've a notion very differently if he had been his wife and the young ladies his daughters whose voices i had heard when mr desmond roused them out of their sleep seemed much interested at hearing about miss o'regan and they all urged the old gentleman to help us and told him that he must go in the morning and see what could be done for the young lady at least he called up a black servant somewhere from the bottom of the house and told him to lead us down to the harbour and show us a boat we might take the old lady pressed us to stop and have some supper but mr desmond was in a hurry to get off and the vice-consul i have a notion wanted to be rid of us why my dears he exclaimed i wonder you like to be seen by the young officer and the sailor such figures as you are in truth both the old lady and the young ones as well as two or three black girls were dressed i must say in a funny fashion with such things as they had clapped on when mr desmond roused them up the old gentleman had put on his breeches hind part before while she had got into his dress-coat with the tails in front and little else on beside her nightgown and a big shawl over her shoulders i won't say how the young ladies looked only i couldn't help remarking that they were not overdressed so that when their father made this remark away they all scuttled in a desperate hurry each trying not to be last and i've a notion that they had forgotten what might be thought of them we could hear them giggling and laughing at each other as they reached their rooms we were you may suppose not much in a mood to laugh just then and as soon as the old black was ready we started off he seemed in a desperate fright expecting every moment that he should be seen and carried off to prison we met no one however and soon reached the water's edge the black who was sent with us i forgot to say because he could speak english showed us a boat hauled up on a slip and going to a shed near brought out a pair of oars a mast and a sail dare you steer for de point up dare he said when you round it pull on for about three miles when you come to another harbour then you pull up it and in de biggest house in de place you find a consul why says mr desmond the vice-consul told us it was not more than a mile or so away massa not know dem answered the old black as soon as he had helped us to launch the boat and without stopping a moment to watch us while we shoved off he ran away as fast as his old legs could carry him we had to pull along shore some distance to keep clear of the corvette then the night breeze freshening we stepped our mast and made sail steering as the black had told us to do the boat was somewhat crank and i had to keep my weather eye open and to hold the sheet in my hand to escape being capsized however the boat sailed fast and soon weathering the point we found our way at last into the harbour we hauled up the boat on the beach and ran along till we came to the big house the vice-consul had told us of this must be the place said mr desmond giving a pull at the door-bell again we had to ring and shout as before no one coming to the door mr desmond proposed trying the old dodge and getting in at the window we went round the house and knocked at all the windows we could reach at last an old gentleman poked out his head from an upper window and threatened in spanish to blow out our brains with a blunderbuss if we didn't take ourselves off mr desmond understood what he said and that he meant it was clear for i caught sight of the muzzle of his piece resting on the window-sill don't do that same if you please sir answered mr desmond i am an officer of her majesty's sloop of war the tudor and my companion is one of her crew and we have come to get the assistance of the consul who i presume you are 
i can't say that he looked much like one in his white nightcap the old gentleman then asked a number of questions of mr desmond who told him all about what had happened and at last having taken some time however to dress himself he came down and let us in he was polite enough then for he showed us into a room and begged us to sit down while he listened to what mr desmond had further to say to him he told us in reply that he had but little influence with general carmona and that he had therefore some time back written to jamaica begging that a ship of war might be sent to protect the english on the coast as their position was far from pleasant he promised however to return to cartagena the next morning and to try what he could to save the colonel's life and obtain the liberation of the other prisoners he advised us to wait till the morning but mr desmond was in a hurry to go back and report to miss o'regan and his messmates what we had done he thought that we could get into the prison before daylight by the way we had come the consul seemed very much astonished at his determination but he was firm and i was ready to do whatever he proposed after all you may be right if you manage to do so without being discovered answered the old gentleman it will save me also from being accused of assisting in the escape of the prisoners having wished the consul good-bye we hastened back to the boat and once more making sail stood out of the harbour the wind however shifting shortly afterwards we made a stretch out to sea thinking to fetch cartagena the next tack when suddenly it again shifted and blew directly off the land not a foot would the boat sail to windward and as to pulling against it that was more than we could do when daylight broke we found ourselves five or six miles off the shore and drifting farther and farther away mr desmond was in a great taking at not getting back to the shore we lowered our sail and i took to the oars but it was all of no use there was a good deal of sea on and we did not even hold our own the sea breeze was longer than usual coming and it was pretty well midday already we had nothing to eat or drink since our supper in the prison all we could hope was that the consul would get back and help our friends at last it fell a dead calm we then got the oars out again and were about to pull back when we heard guns in the offing and i guessed that they must be fired by the ship of war the consul had told us of mr desmond thought i was right and we agreed that we should serve our friends better by pulling off towards her we had a long pull as you know sir and i am thankful that i was right and i am certain it won't be mr murray's fault if he don't give the dons a lesson which will teach them not to play tricks with englishmen in future End of section fourteen.